Castle Rock is finally here, and with it a ton of mystery. So in this series we're going to delve into each episode and unlock some of the secrets that lay ahead. The first episode begins in the winter of 1991 near what we'll later learn are the bluffs near Castle Lake. Here we see Alan Pangborn, the town sheriff, load a gun while listening to the radio. The radio is important as it announces the mysterious disappearance of a small boy, Henry Deaver. Using his stick, Pangborn checks the surrounding snow for a body. He stops when he finds something, only to be relieved when it's just a dead deer. A deer that can also be found on the Castle Rock Town emblem. While stopping to rest, a mysterious sound alerts Pangborn. To me it sounds similar to the noises found in Lost, which, by the way, was also produced by Bad Robot, the production company involved with Castle Rock. After the sound subsides, Pangborn is shocked to see Henry, alive in the middle of the frozen lake. How he got there, we don't know, but the lake seems to hold some mysterious power. Fast forward 27 years to the summer of 2018. Here we meet Dale Lacey and his wife. Some might miss it, but it's important to note here that Dale's wife is blind. This will become significant near the later part of the episode, which I'll reveal at the end of this video. Dale kisses his wife goodbye, and we learn this is supposed to be his last day of work before retirement. But the day doesn't go where we think it's going, as Dale has other plans around Castle Lake, the same lake from the beginning. And those plans involve suicide by decapitation. The title of the pilot is called Severance, a double entendre referring to the six-figure severance Dale is to receive, and the severed head he is about to as well. <laughs> Before Dale hits the gas, he's interrupted by a dog. Now, I think that this dog is actually a figment of his imagination. Its significance we don't quite know yet, but the lake seems to have the ability to conjure memories or figments of the imagination, which we'll find occurs again later on. Shortly after, Dale hits the gas, is killed, and it's revealed he works for Shawshank Correctional Facility, the same prison in Stephen King's Rita Hayworth and the Shawshank Redemption. This image transitions us to the real Shawshank, where we meet the new warden. Officer Chesterton gives a brief nod to Shawshank by telling her this is where Warden Norton shot himself. You'll remember him from the movie Shawshank. <laughs> Reeves, the warden's number two, tells her that Dale Lacey's head was never recovered while she moves an ashtray. From my office, I'd kill myself too. A small detail that will be revealed later in the episode. Officers Zaleski and Boyd go to visit abandoned cell block F, which hasn't been opened since the Christmas fire in 87, an event we may see in future episodes. Zaleski ventures further by himself, eventually stumbling upon a hole in the ground. He travels further to find a notepad, a bucket of cigarettes, and a book before the big reveal of Bill Skarsgård's character who, on I'm DB is simply known as the Shawshank Prisoner, but on the internet, the kid. So for the purposes of the series, I'll refer to him as the kid until further notice. We get a quick look at his eyes, which are an odd mix of blue and amber. But the important thing to note here is that the notepad Zaleski picks up and the book are never seen again. It will be interesting to see if they make an appearance in future episodes. In the next scene, the kid is questioned by Chesterton on his mysterious appearance. The fly here can also be seen in Zaleski's coffee later on in the episode. The kid is unusually afraid when the fingerprint machine clicks. Is he afraid of sudden noises, or has he never seen this technology before? Possibly hinting he's not from this time or place. The warden inspects the cigarette butts found in the water tank and compares them to those of former warden Dale Lacey. Both of them are Marlboros. When interrogating the kid, the warden asks him who he is, to which he responds, Henry, Matthew, Deaver. We'll get to know Henry Deaver in the next scene, where we see the adult Deaver defending Leanne Chambers in a Texas courthouse. Leanne is the wife of Richard Chambers, who you may remember as one of the antagonists in Stand By Me. She's on death row for supposedly killing him. Deaver loses the case, and while Leanne is having her last meal, she asks him what his earliest memory is. We flash back to Pangborn rushing young Deaver through the forest. She then has a cryptic conversation about the afterlife, comparing it to a tape being erased and consequently not being yourself anymore. Kind of like when Pangborn put the tape into the cassette player and found Henry, who was not the same and whose memory was erased. The idea of memory loss is found in several characters in this episode, including the kid, Henry, and Henry's mother, Ruth, who we'll get to know soon. Back in the flashback, Pangborn is amazed to find young Henry's hands aren't riddled with frostbite for being in the negative 40 degree forest for 11 days. Wherever he was, was it the same place as the kid? A place where time stands still, or a different world entirely? 
Zaleski looks at Henry Deaver's file while pouring coffee for the warden. We learn that the town believes Henry's disappearance was supposedly a prank by Henry himself, resulting in the death of his father, who was found frozen to death with his back broken. For those interested, the axe here is the same type as used by Jack Torrance in The Shining. Deaver gets a call from Zaleski telling him to come to Shawshank to see the mysterious kid who called him by name. You can see the odd directorial choice to frame him in front of a noose, perhaps foreshadowing a throwback to Dale Lacey or both. Back in Castle Rock, we're introduced to Molly Strand, who purchases unknown drugs from a local high schooler. What they're for, we'll have to find out. On her way home, Molly watches as Henry gets off the bus, the same type of bus that Red uses in the Shawshank Redemption. It's clear from her reaction she doesn't want him to see her, and that there is some mysterious past between them. On the way to his mother's house, Henry stops at his father's old church and finds that the cemetery where his father is buried is now a cement lot. This triggers a flashback of him telling Pangborn he doesn't remember what happened. We also get a glimpse of a mysterious white trinket, the meaning of which has yet to be revealed. Back at his childhood home, we meet Henry's mother, Ruth Deaver, played by Sissy Spacek, who was Carrie in De Palma's adaptation of Stephen King's novel of the same name. She doesn't remember him and seems to suffer from some sort of Alzheimer's or dementia, which explains the stove being left on, forgetting his name, carrying the icing salt in the summer, and also wearing a toque, which could also be the same toque worn by him in 1991. We are now introduced to older Alan Pangborn, and it seems there's a lot of tension between him and Henry. Alan has been helping Ruth, but Henry suspects he's been leeching off of her. In the background, a nature documentary shows a snake killing a mouse, which is interesting because the next scene with the kid in prison features a mouse. And mice are no strangers to prisons in the Stephen King universe, if you recall Mr. Jingles in The Green Mile. And just like Mr. Jingles, this mouse faces a similar fate, as it seems the kid has some sort of power which hints he may be able to control animals telepathically. Henry meets the warden only to be given the cold shoulder. The warden says, I wish I could help you find your client, Mr. Deaver. I can't very well call up a ghost. Which the writers may be giving us a hint that the kid is some sort of supernatural being. We also learn that Henry's father used to visit the prison to conduct Bible studies. That links the Deavers with the prison and likely this kid character. And the warden has already taken down the photos of the old warden in the background. In this scene where Henry and Zaleski share a look, you can make out mist over the prison walls, even though it's a completely sunny day. At home, Henry notices a next-door neighbor watching him. On this newspaper, we see the headline, Suicide at Shawshank, which I think is worded a bit weird since the suicide didn't happen at Shawshank, rather at Castle Lake. You know where he did it? Castle Lake. The Bluff. Right where I found you. Henry tells Alan about his call from Zaleski at Shawshank, and we learn Alan and Dale once knew each other. Molly takes out Henry's missing person poster that apparently she saved along with a plaid sweater. These mementos, including the hourglass, must have some significance for her to keep them all these years. Henry goes to visit Dale Lacey's makeshift memorial where he has a vision of the winter and himself as a kid. Could this mean he'll start remembering what happened? Or that the lake may hold visions for our characters, like the dog from the beginning? We also see a cross on the gravesite and one in his home. It's easy to assume that Henry's father being a reverend, that religion will play a big role in connecting a lot of these characters. Zaleski on security watch notices that the kid has escaped from his cell and that several of the guards have been brutally murdered. The kid seemingly opens the cell doors with his mind, leading me to believe that he may have telekinesis on par with that of Carrie. And in the final scene, we see that it was Dale Lacey who kept the kid locked up. Judging by the amount of cigarette butts, it was for some time. But it begs the question, if the kid has powers, how come he didn't escape? Why now? I think Dale has some power over the kid because for half a second his eyes flicker. This little detail is easy to miss. But here's one of the most interesting finds. If you stop the video before Dale ventures up the ladder, you can make out what appears to be an adjustable walking stick, the same used by the blind. Is there a connection between the kid, Dale, and his blind wife? I guess we'll just have to keep watching to find out. Thanks for tuning in. If you want more of these episode breakdowns, make sure to like and subscribe. I'm really digging the show, and I think it's only going to get better. Leave a comment below on the things I missed, and let's work together to solve the mysteries of Castle Rock. See you soon.